why a framework and why, so we're not sure it should be called, we're not necessarily uh, software engineers, but uh, some of us, some of us are. <laughs> but the, uh, so why a framework and why we call that? Um, so w we are aware that uh, scaling and positioning has been going on forever because people have been using those things. And it's not like we are, we discovered again, you know, uh, something new. Uh, it's a basic need. Uh, so there are some guidelines and there is a variety of practices in the field. So we know there are guidelines for SUMS, which are public with some tools to assist and so on and so forth. But we can even go back, they were like in Numos 2, they were kind of like efforts and some of which were really interesting uh, stuff, honestly, that was, that was really cool. And uh, I'm not sure where they are now, currently. Some of them have kind of uh, disappeared. Oftentimes people end up, especially in the academic, doing their custom scripts, like we call them. Uh, so pick your MATLAB or whatever. Sometimes they can be very sophisticated. Some of the stuff that M3 is doing is quite sophisticated uh, about the uh, uh, statistical shape models and articulation and things like that. Uh, so the practice is diverse. That's for the least the, uh, where we are. So the idea was like, okay, uh, all these are based on numerical methods, which oftentimes are the same, uh, especially for scaling. When you look at things, it's not so different. And so um, maybe we could share at least the data and the uh, uh, process used for scaling and positioning, because if we don't share them, the model that's run at the end, once scaled and positioned, it's going to be maybe a little more difficult to compare if we started from the same point. Uh, and the rationale for scaling across models and for sharing across models and, and processes is that HBMs are, have become somewhat similar. I mean, like uh, when you look at SAMS before, GHBMC, uh, with a little less detail, the, the pi per child model, it's not so different. It's deformable materials, joints with contacts, and so on and so forth. And uh, we're not talking about, you know, this is not Madimo versus, uh, uh, you know, whatever. So um, the advantages of sharing the techniques would be that there would be no need to re-implement all the time that for a different model. Uh, you could compare between things. And, um, and so that, that could be pretty interesting. So we organized the user survey, and I'm sure a lot of you actually answered that uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the project. Um, we're very happy about that. So the data is a little bit old, uh, you know, it was 2013, 14. Uh, and so w w a few key points here on where we got back from the users. Uh, people seem to be interested mostly in global st stature, shape change, more than local things. What they wanted is to have different anthropometries, different body weights, uh, different things like that. Uh, maybe some of us in the research field would like to g get a femur that's exactly that shape, but that's not what people were asking. Um, for positioning, in the end, a lot of things were based on visual estimation, which is like looking at how the interaction with the environment is, and so that some visual feedback probably could be nice. Uh, and that, at the time, was taking two, four to six more time uh, to, p to position than a dummy. And then there were parametric studies and batches that came quite a few times in the, uh, in the, in the answers. So that's, that's what we got from the users. The most important point that we got, and where really, uh, I personally changed really my mind thinking about it uh, when looking at the uh, responses, is that we thought nobody is using these models, but the situation is incredibly diverse already. Uh, which is there is SAMS v3, then the next commonly used was GHBMC, then there were other models, then there was SAMS v4, and now there's going to be Piper. So there is a variety, a variety of models, a variety of versions, a variety of codes that people have there. People were using Windows, some were using Linux, and so, uh, okay. Once we started, and, uh, and I think it was Norbert that uh, made this point, which is like, if we start picking up the first choice of each, each question, and that we are unlucky that the guy that's really interested in this is actually running Linux on another code, then at the end, once you multiply all the probabilities, at the end you have no users left. So uh, and that's an issue. So we cannot do that, otherwise we're going to exclude most of everyone, and what we're trying to do is share across people. So this, this was really something that came from uh, strong from, the, uh, from this. So the requirements that we set, and the first one that was very strong, we struggled at the beginning to know how to do it for the framework, is that it should be model and solver agnostic, which is like it should not be specific to things like this. 
uh, we should not uh, do that, and we should not try to develop templates for everything like we, that we're going to read like every code uh, up to the last drop of information that's in it, because that's just not possible. There are also IP issues, and, uh, and there are other people doing that, and that's not really the aim of the project. And um, the second thing is that since there is this variety of practice, where are we to tell people how to do it? Uh, so we should not tell users how to do their job. They found solutions already, they have processes that are already in place. They have this di diversity of practices, but we should attempt not to discriminate uh, against this, we should provide options. And, uh, and in terms of modeling intention, of course the models, uh, they are not exactly what we would like them to do, to be basically, but uh, we should work with it. Which is we should try to help people position and personalize the models they have and not tell them how they should do their models, even if it's in the end not possible to do it, because otherwise you won't have any users at the end either, and it will be more difficult. Um, so we want to give s uh, users possibilities, and there can be several methods to do the same thing, and that's okay, we assume that. Uh, later on, maybe there will be less, we will expand, and then we will uh, reduce. We will say, okay, this is really... Uh, the way it could work. And so we have preliminary things, guidelines for that, maybe that can come up, but we're not at that point, yes. And so modular, because people can add their modules, they will be able to, uh, to do that, and that will be shown a little bit how the project is structured there. In terms of platform and what we should be looking for, if we want interactive tools, uh, some uh, visual feedback, and if you look at models like, you know, the SAMS v4 or GHBMC, it's going to take a little more than uh, plot a figure in a MATLAB script, because uh, that, that's not going to work. So we need some performance in there, uh, so something that's a little more uh, um, a tool. Um, but because we are aware of the community that we're talking about here, we, we, need, we, we need people that are able to do things without recompiling everything every time, otherwise that's not going to work either. So, uh, so that was something uh, important. We're a community of uh, mechanical engineers and not a community of uh, uh, programmers in here, mostly. Uh, so then, what are the basic concepts that are in the framework? I'm mentioning them now because they will come back later uh, today. So, what constrains basically the, uh, the scaling and the positioning? It's concepts such as the anatomy, uh, the physiology, uh, range of motion, statistics about how dimensions are interrelated and things like that. This is what constrains really the, uh, this a priori knowledge, it's, it's what constrains really the, uh, the scanning and the positioning. This knowledge is typically not described in an FE model, uh, meaning like uh, when you open a model, uh, it, besides the name that's not standardized, there is nothing that says that it's a femur, it just says that it's a solid element and uh, it could very well be foam, uh, it's the same. So this information is not in there. What's in the model in the end? There is the geometry that nowadays is pretty good because of the uh, element size. Uh, there is an OK mechanical response that's mostly for 20G, but that sometimes, and I take uh, Jonah's question there, sometimes still works about right at two, the 2Gs that Arbogast had, and uh, it's not so wrong. Um, it depends how close we look at the results. But typically these properties are 2G is the limit, like it's not designed for, you know, just doing this. Uh, but other things such as uh, coordination laws and things like this, they are, they are a priori knowledge and it's not in the model. So the first step in the basic concept that I'm introducing is to establish a correspondence so that we can basically link whatever is in the human model to, the, uh, um, um, to this a priori knowledge. Um, so we need this association, uh, why? And we need concept. For example, bones, they are not expected to deform during positioning. So if you don't know that it's a bone, then maybe it will deform. So you basically need to know it's a bone. And, uh, and if you want to scale, you need to know uh, where the head is, as we have seen earlier in the child model and things like this. Uh, material properties, do we need to describe them so much? For, uh, for scaling, maybe not as much, and maybe not to the numerical parameters uh, in the end that are in the models. So uh, the bo this association is what we call the metadata. You will have the same thing in the describing a, a, a dummy uh, for positioning. You, you still need to say which part is which, wh what is a joint, and so on and so forth. It needs to be done only once unless the model changes, of course. And so there will be a whole presentation of metadata uh, on that, because uh, there'll, there'll be probably one of the few things that, that people would try to do first with models. Uh, 
So then there is this concept of anatomical entities. And uh, so if we want to be able to exchange between modules, methodologies, and things like this, um, we need to have a common vocabulary. So there is a, we did that, we're not saying it's perfect, but uh, so there is a database, it's what we did, to define joint, you know, common names, common things that can be uh, shared basically between uh, the different modules, methodology, know if it's rigid, if it should deform or not. Um, so this database actually derived from other databases such as FMA and then we added things and, uh, and things like that. It's things that can evolve and th so this is in the manual, like there are everything in there, you know, the things that you can describe that are understood then and can be used within the context of, uh, of positioning or personalization. So it's easily ed editable. Uh, of course it would be nice if uh, it, it stayed as a uh, reasonable database. But the, uh, and so then the, uh, this is really the basis for the, uh, for the association. So what do you need to describe when you import a model for positioning or scaling? Well, it depends, uh, far from everything. Uh, basically for simpler, uh, you know, geometrical transformation, which are most of them, for example, it's what, you know, we described with the char models, you actually just need to know the node coordinates. That's what you are really going to transform. You're not going to remesh, uh, you're just going to do that. It's really easy to read node coordinates. It's, it's really, like, so this is for Dyna, it's the same in the other code. Uh, so you have a text file and uh, you have a node ID and XYZ. So if you tell basically, uh, okay, after star node, uh, you have XYZ and um, that's it. That's all you need to know to actually read that. And if you can read that, which is really easy to do with a rule, uh, then you can uh, read the nodes and you can transform the model. For you still need the atomical structure, but that's the method I want to be described later. And, um, and so there is no need to understand the whole model, the hourglass parameters, and so on and so forth. And so we need to have this minimum metadata that says what's rigid and not rigid. That's, there is just no way to, uh, to go around it. And, uh, and so on and so forth. But basically what you need to describe is, de is going to depend what you do with the transformation. For some stuff you don't need to describe much and for others you need to describe more. And so, uh, so in each module, and, uh, and this will be mentioned later today in applications, uh, you know, basically if you want to do that you're going to need to describe at least that in your, uh, in your metadata. Once you have imported all this info, what do you have? And there I'm not saying what do you have on the screen, I'm saying conceptually. Uh, conceptually, what you have is that you have a geometry, you have uh, some uh, meaning, whether it's rigid or not, and so on and so forth. In the end, you have something that we could call a model. So this is the concept. This is what we call the Piper model, which is basically what we do, wh is that we take a model, we interpret it through anatomy or other things, and these relationships, and we end up with another model, which we call the Piper model. So what's the interest for that? This model is built dynamically when you import your EFI model in the application. And uh, the interest is that then we can work on that. We can basically transform it. Meaning you start with your EFI model, you read what you need to read, you end up with this model which is stored in a structure inside the software, and then you can update it with various numerical methods that do positioning, scaling, or whatever. And you can keep updating it. You don't need to re-export to uh, right away to, uh, to whatever you have in your FE model. And by the way, for the export, the export is more uh, an update. Meaning since we know what we read and we know exactly what we read, we can just update these values and we don't touch the rest of the model because we haven't read it, so we don't even know what's in there. Of course, we should not touch it. And um, so these models is, is composed of Piper entities, which are described in the manual. Typically, what are the concepts that you need to uh, uh, access? Uh, nodes, elements, so these are important. This is the geometry, there's no way to go around it. And then there are some anatomical concepts, such as landmarks, joints. There are contacts and things like this that, uh, that are described, contact and collisions. And then there is the, um, the weight structure, the skeletal structure. So these are pretty much always needed to be, uh, to be there. And then there are things that are more, uh, more specific. So, so far I've said all kinds of things on, the, on this concept, but I haven't said anything about what's the transformation, which is uh, how do we specify that? Uh, so typically there is a source, which is where you start from, the, uh, the Piper model at its current state. And then there is a target. So how do you define this target? 
Um, so, and what is it? So for us, uh, we have this concept of a Piper target, couldn't find a better name, um, which is a collection of all kinds of info that you can put in it. So there is the stature, for example, and there is also uh, the uh, circumference at the wrist and the joint angle. So it's all in there. So, um, so it's sometimes there is almost nothing in the target because we saw that what the users wanted is to update the stature, but you cannot just scale a human model with age, for example, by just changing the stature, because you need to know what are the all the dimensions and things like that. So you can basically store all that in that object and you can update it. So the idea is like we have a target where the basic the basic one is a few predictors typically from the uh, from the user. It's typically too broad to do a reasonable transformation of the uh, human model. But then we have a modular structure and we are basically going to uh, enrich the target. We're going to add some stuff with uh, statistics or whatever we can. And we're going to try to make it more detailed until the point it's acceptable and we can transform the model. So, uh, so this target improvement, I would say, is there that the a priori knowledge is coming, which is its regressions, it can be uh, postural preferences and things like that. And so, uh, so in the end, uh, we have a modular structure that can work both on the target and on the model. And when the user is okay or sufficiently okay with, the, with, the, with this, with the target, the users can have previews in pretty much uh, every, uh, every module. And then they can finally apply the transformation, which can take a little longer, and, uh, and then update the model. So that's the structure of the concept. It's, uh, it's, I want to have this slide a bit abstract still. But to introduce the concept, because in the slides and stuff in presentation later, we probably won't go so much into details about that. And so th these are the basic concepts. You should be more or less familiar with them because you know what? There's nothing new in there. Uh, when people morph a model using a MATLAB script, they do the same. They just don't give it a name. Uh, they still need to describe the anatomical structure, which they do uh, by placing their points for the uh, transformation. Uh, they still need to read the nodes because they need to update them. They still need, uh, and so on and so forth. So the same concepts are there. They have the a priori data, they have everything. It's just not formalized and it's a little more difficult to uh, basically reuse them because uh, every time you start with a different model, you need pretty much to rewrite your script. We know that because we've done it. So, uh, so the idea here is to try to specify that, give it some name, some vocabulary, so that we can have a modular structure and reuse the, uh, basically the, uh, the stuff. So uh, how it's uh, how it's uh, structured? So the uh, so we have this Piper model, we have this metadata, uh, we have the Effie solver interpretation, which is uh, like a rule-based uh, thing. So uh, not to reinvent yet another uh, format, uh, it's basically XML files uh, that can validate and things like that. Uh, so they are pretty self-explanatory, and uh, and everything is in the manual about how to uh, how to do those. Um, Everything in there, inc including the metadata, adding a solver can be added by the user without recompiling the software. That's uh, our way to try to be as open uh, for that for people that are mechanical engineers. Uh, Piper is open source, so we have access to all kinds of open source libraries. Honestly, for s many of those would have access even if it wasn't open source because they are under very liberal licenses. Uh, but so basically, key libraries are built around VTK, the SOFI framework for real-time positioning, Eigen, and things like this. The application is mostly written in C++ uh, with a Qt GUI and currently runs on both Windows and Linux. Uh, it has some batch functionality, not as much as it would have wanted uh, to do like fully automated stuff. And it has reasonable hardware requirements. There is no uh, CUDA acceleration or things like that that requires a specific graphic card. When I write reasonable is that uh, if you cannot open the GHBMC on your machine uh, because uh, it's too slow, you should not, uh, don't expect to open it in Piper. You know, like it's the same number of nodes and elements, so I'm not sure what you would expect there. But it's, it's reasonable, even for uh, interactive processes. Uh, because we know that these are not typically the uh, cup of tea of everybody here in the room, uh, um, there, there is uh, uh, possibilities to do things uh, programmatically without uh, recompiling again. 
so there are two scripting languages that are included in the uh, in the uh, in, in, in the application. So one, there is a Python interface, which is the best one really, because you can have access to a lot of the variables and a lot of the structures which are inside. You can actually read the Python model, you can update it, uh, you can export it, you can re-import it, work on it outside, and so on and so forth. So you can do a lot of things in there through the Python interface. And then, because uh, we're kind of uh, addicted to MATLAB, I guess, <laughs> I've heard, uh, some of us, not me, but some of us, uh, there is also an, an Octave interpreter that's provided with the uh, distribution. It's loosely uh, uh, you know, integrated, which is you, need you, you can basically run it, but you need to exchange through files, and uh, you cannot update variables and things like that. But you could do a Python wrapper around or something like this to, uh, to do something. It's actually used. Some of the modules that are inside Piper are actually written in, uh, in Octave. So, uh, so that's why it's also uh, distributed. So both are possible. So this is what it looks like. So we are not graphic designers, in case you did not figure it out, but the information will get to your brain uh, with that. Um, so I see Thomas Lemaire, which is actually here as a <laughs> software engineer, where he's like, you know, come on, it's not so bad. <laughs> okay, depends on people's standards. So this is what we have. We have, a, we have a GUI, we have things like this. It won't be described with much details, but we're going to do real-life uh, demos, um, uh, hoping it will work. And uh, um, uh, that are in there, and so um, I won't describe that so so much uh, uh, in there. But so again, uh, software will be on the uh, on the USB key when you leave. So with that, we have all this, and you still need to import your model and uh, your sums or your whatever you have. And there is this metadata creation process, uh, which is uh, the big question because this is where it all starts. If you can't import it, you can't do much. And so for that, uh, we have Jeremy here that we're going to do a presentation on that. And uh, Jeremy created the metadata uh, for SUMS uh, on his own, pretty much. And, uh, and so he's going to talk a little bit about how to do that. And uh Thank you, Philippe. So already Philippe touched a couple of words about uh, metadata. I'm going to try just to... Uh, show you more from a uh, perspective from the user what does it mean to create those metadata and I will try uh, actually to show you that uh, it's not difficult. Basically I'm a FE guy, I don't have uh, any special uh, programming uh, skills and as Philippe say, uh, I was able without too much difficulty to create the metadata for the, the TAMS models. Uh, as you already understood, there are two models. So there is your finite element uh, model and there is the Piper model. So the finite element model is going to be input or output of the Piper framework. And the Piper model is something which is more like an internal uh, model for Piper. Uh, there are a number of things which are similar between those two models. For example, there are mesh components like nodes, elements, which, the, uh, which are present in your FE model and that the Piper model will be able to read and, and use. Uh, but there are also some differences. And uh, one of them is that not all uh, the data which are present in your FE model are actually needed in the Piper model. Uh, for example, in our FE model, we have a lot of material laws normally, uh, which can be sometimes pretty complex, like viscoelastic and hyperelastic and so on. Actually, the Piper model will not need all of this information. Also, in our um, FE models, we have a lot of contacts uh, between all the entities of the body. Uh, there will be also some contacts in the Piper uh, model, but this will be more of a reduced set of contacts, like bone-to-bone -bone contacts or capsule ligament-to-bone contacts. This is mostly what we'll have. Um, so there are some things which will not be uh, needed to be read, uh, read or used in the, in the Piper model, but there are also some additional things which belong to the, to the Piper model compared to your FE model. And as already Philip touched about, uh, there is an anatomical structure in the Piper model, which is not present in your FE model. As Philip said, you don't need to know that the femur in your FE model is a bone. It's just something which has a certain material property and can be deformed uh, according to that. But the Piper uh, framework needs to know where are the bones in your model, where is the skin, where are eventually the capsule or the ligaments to be able to, to work with that. So there is really an atom anatomical structure which is defined with, uh, we already talked about it also, um, a dictionary which has been uh, defined for that. 
There are also uh, other things like landmarks, for example, which you can use uh, for positioning or for scaling, uh, which must be identify, uh, identified in your Python model. And all this process of identifying the important information in your finite element model for the uh, for a Piper model is what we call actually metadata. So from a practical standpoint, what does it mean for the user? You have a FE model and you need to start from null and create metadata for this model. What are you going to do? There are actually two steps. The first step is something you can do with your standard uh, preprocessing software and it's uh, just to add some additional groups uh, in your model. So for example, group of elements, which are going to help you to define the anatomical entities for the Piper model, group of nodes, which can be used for landmarks or contact region between uh, different uh, anatomical entities. So again, we are staying here in our FE code. We are doing everything with our standard tools. Uh, and we have what we call here uh, a prepared HPM. Once you have that, you need uh, another file, which is a XML format file. It's a pretty easy uh, format to, to use. Um, and this will basically uh, define the associations between those uh, groups you have defined before and anatomical entities or landmark or whatever you need for your Piper model. Uh, there are also some uh, functional constraints uh, which have to be defined between the different entities, like joint. Uh, kinematics, will be, which will be used for the positioning in the Piper tool, or contacts between uh, different entities. And now I'm going to give you just a few examples, uh, practical examples. It's defined in this XML file, and I will try to show you that it's pretty easy. Uh, the first thing you have to, to define when you have a FE model is uh, to use it in the, in the Piper framework is to define an anatomical entities. And I have two examples here. In uh, one of the examples, we are defining an entity which is called left femur, so you know what is it. And this entity uh, in Piper is going to be associated to a set of parts which has the ID 1 million in your FE model. So this is basically gathering all the parts constituting the, the femur in your FE model. So it's very easy. And you can do it several ways. Here it's a set of parts, but you can also do it with a set of elements. Here a set of shell elements has been defined, for example, for defining the skin of the lower limb. So I think it's pretty straightforward for someone who knows a bit FE models. Um, another thing you will have to define is landmarks. Um, and you have several ways to do it, really. The, the most uh, common way, let's say, or the most easy way is that you're going to basically to associate a node um, ID of your FE model to a name of landmark. So here, the anterior, anterior point of the superior plate of C4, for example. So just basic association between a node and a landmark name. Um, you can do it um, a bit more complex. For example, you have a, a set of nodes here. And you are going j basically to say um, to Piper that it should take the barycenter of this set of nodes in your finite element model and uh, uh, assign it to the landmark called center of upper plate of C4. Again, pretty easy. Now if we look at kinematic joints, which are needed for positioning uh, tool. So it's again pretty easy. Uh, we are trying to define the, the right, right hip joint. Uh, so this is a joint between two entities. The first entity, which you should have defined before, uh, is the pelvic skeleton. And the second entity is the right femur. And they are both associated to uh, coordinate systems, uh, which, you, uh, which have the ID1 in your FE code. And the uh, only thing you need to define then is uh, the allowed uh, degrees of freedom for this joint. So here, basically, we have said that only the three uh, rotation are load for this joint. Other example, uh, sometimes you will need to read a material parameter in your uh, FE uh, model and be able to, to later on in the Piper tool uh, update this uh, material parameter. Here what we are trying to do is to define a material parameter which we call the skull cortical modulus and it's basically taking the young modulus of the elastic material law which have those ID in your FE model and now this will be assigned so to to the this name in your Piper model, and you will be able to update it. 
uh, that's uh, something, for example, we need to do for the child model. If you need to uh, update the material properties according to the age uh, of the child, this is something the Piper model will be then able to do. The Piper tool will be able to do, sorry. Um, so I talked about this XML file, and uh, you can, of course, uh, create this uh, XML file with a normal text editor. But there is an additional option uh, which has been added, uh, added directly in the Piper uh, framework. So in the Piper tool now, you have a metadata editor where you can uh, basically edit or, uh, or create uh, some metadata. Uh, you can create anatomical entities as we saw, landmarks, joints, what you need. Um, and you can update your metadata file directly from the Piper tool. So you don't need um, to redo it manually after. So now um, we have been able actually to create a number of metadata in, the, in this project. So we have uh, used a number of models, and for those models, we were able to import it and to use it uh, with the Piper tool. Uh, here is the, the list of the, of the model we have used uh, in this project. So it's mostly based on the avail availability in our group of these models, actually. Um, so we defined uh, metadata, of course, for the child model. Uh, we define also metadata for the global human body model, uh, two of them, actually the detailed uh, occupant 50th percentile male in LS Dyna in Pam Crash. We also did it for the simplified pedestrian model. Um, we also uh, could uh, do it for the TAMS models, so the version 3, the version 4.02 also, on both occupant models. And we uh, did it also for the VIVA model, which is a open source uh, female 50th percentile model. So you see we were able to do it for a number of models. And uh, there will be uh, actually in the last uh, session uh, today uh, some more details about the status and availability of those metadata for future users. Um, so just to summarize, I tried to make it simple. Uh, and I think, I hope I showed you that it's pretty easy to create and edit those metadata. Um, you can, uh, you need just two things. You need so this uh, prepared uh, FEHPN, which you can create using your standard FE preprocessing tool. And you need this XML file, which you can modify whether with a text editor or with the Piper tool. And really, I would say there is no programming skills needed there. Any Infinity Element guy will be able to do that. Another thing I want to say is that I think it's pretty flexible, actually. What I mean is that you don't need all your metadata to, to just work with one specific Piper module. So it might be that for your application, you only need a very few number of metadata, and it's going to be pretty easy to create. And that will end this session. <laughs>